Humans are not the only ones who participate in war. Copious kinds of animals have been accompanying them, joining them on the battlefield. The obvious one being the horse, the archetypal animal of war, turned into a devastating weapon by horsemen and mounted nobility. But horses were not the only ones used for militaristic purposes, both in the past and to a certain extent even in the present. So if you're interested, please keep watching to find out more. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking. So, I would like to begin by talking about dogs, the canine contribution to the battlefield. I reckon we're all familiar with the concept of shock cavalry and how knights were deployed, but what were war dogs supposed to do? Scouts, sentries, trackers, combatants, warhounds had, and to a certain extent still have, multiple purposes. Dogs man's best friends have been faithful companions in all aspects of human life, including war, since ancient times. The earliest records of use of canine in war are from 2100 BC. Dogs were used by the Britons, Slavs, Egyptians, Greeks, Persians, Sarmatians, Alans, Lydians and of course the Romans. But not all dogs could become war dogs, only the strongest would be trained for combat. Are you a war dog? Do you want to be a war dog? Yes? Do you want me to bring you to battle? You can't be a war dog, mate. You're not a war dog. Do you want me to train you? Okay, repeat after me. Roma Invicta. Billy. Roma Caput Mundi. I don't have all day. Come on. Roma Caput Mundi. Billy, the Centurion is not going to fed yet if you, if you just don't say anything. Like, everybody's going to say it, and you're not going to say anything. What is the Centurion going to think? Come on. Weni, Weedy, Wiki. In fact, the Romans used a specific breed, the dog of the Molossia region of Epirus, because it was the strongest they could find, specifically training them for battle. We do need to specify that in classical times, Romans and Greeks mostly used dogs as sentries and patrols, but at times they would also use them against the enemy. Dogs not only could kill some enemies, but they could also help infantry rout them. Armoured dogs could be used to attack enemies or defend caravans. Sentries. This is one of the earliest military related uses. The concept is very simple. Dogs would be deployed to defend the perimeter of a camp or any area with military value or significance. If an enemy were to get close or something strange were to happen, the dog would growl or bark, which would alert the guards, resulting in rapid deployment of reinforcements if needed. Attack dogs. Large mastiff or molesser type would be armored or strapped with spiked collars and sent to attack the enemy. Mascots. Designed to uplift morale, dogs were used as mascots, belonging either to an officer or being adopted by an entire unit. See, the Roman province of Britannia was famous for exporting dogs. In fact, British dogs were famous for being stronger and faster. They were used for hunting and on the battlefield. In the Middle Ages, dogs were used for hunting by the nobles, and they were used as reliable guards, shepherds, and sometimes they would even protect peasants from wolf attacks. Now, we have all heard of the German Shepherd, but the Bohemian Shepherd is a dog breed which has been in use at least since the 13th century on Czech and German borders. But why is it called Bohemian Shepherd? Well, let's talk a little bit about the Hodové an ethnic group living in Western Bohemia. Now they live in the western border of Czech Republic, in the region called Hodzko. During the medieval period, the monarchy of the Kingdom of Bohemia recruited their ancestors to serve as guards along the borders between Bohemia and Bavaria. Their main duty was to signal the enemy's movements and alert the army if necessary. They had the right of unrestricted movement within the Bohemian forest and the right to own large dogs forbidden to ordinary bohemian peasantry. 
Okay, enough about dogs for now. We will get back to them in the third part of this video where we will discuss modern usage of dogs, law enforcement, etc. But now I would like to focus on animals and armor. In order to do so, I would like to focus back on horses. And when we talk about horses and armor, of course, we're talking about barding. Now, there is an obvious tactical advantage for an animal being armored. An armored animal's chances of survival on the battlefield are dramatically improved, allowing its rider to plunge deeper into the fray. Horse armor in Europe seems to have originated in the Middle Ages, armor being part of the animal's tuck. Saddles, stirrups, halters, reins are all forms of a horse tack. All these components would be stored in a tack room near the stable. Armour is not a foreign concept within the animal world. Several animal species are provided with superficial protection, armoured structures to defend them against predators. Armour has hence developed mostly in prey species. But what is it made of? An example of naturally occurring armour is the chitinous exoskeleton of anthropods. To help out with the terminology a little here, an anthropod is any invertebrate animal of the phylum Anthropoda, having a segmented body and a chitinous shell which undergoes moltings. Now this includes insects, spiders and other arachnoids, crustaceans and myriapods. Most reptiles have scaly skins, used for protection and water retention. Other examples are the exoskeletons of crocodiles and the famous shells of tortoise and turtles. The turtle shell is absolutely fascinating. It's a complex natural shield which completely encloses the vital organs of turtles, tortoise and terrapins. Now, there are several kinds of carapace, most of which are made of skeletal and dermal bone. Now, I find some of these particularly interesting because they have a sort of hinge between the pectoral and abdominal scutes, which allows the turtle to completely enclose itself. You see, we're all familiar with what a turtle shell is, but what's interesting to say is that the scutes which form the shell are made of keratin. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, keratin is a fibrous structural protein which forms the main structural constituent of horny epidermal tissue. In other words, hair, nails, etc. Chitin is another substance used in the animal world to form natural armor, among other things. It's a long chain polymer of an N-acetylglucosamine, which is a derivative of glucose, a fibrous substance consisting of polysaccharides, which are the major constituent in the exoskeleton of anthropods and the cell wall of fungi. War elephants have been used as integral parts of Indian kings' armies, although we have accounts dating to the 2nd and 1st millennia BC mentioning elephants for transport. Alexander the Great was so impressed at the Battle of Guagamila by the Persian deployment of 15 war elephants that after winning the battle, he himself started using elephants in war. And then, of course, Hannibal and the Carthaginians are another historical example of the usage of elephants on the battlefield, their main function being intimidation, breaking ranks and stamping. War elephants were used by the Chinese too. The Han dynasty made use of them in 1948 AD, but the southern Han elephant were eventually defeated in 971, being completely annihilated by crossbow fire from Song dynasty troops. Apparently the Romans used pigs as an anti-elephant tactics during their conflict against Paris. They would be dousing the pigs in flammable tar or resin, setting them alight and then having them run towards the elephants. Also, the Macedonians allegedly used incendiary pigs, according to military writer Polyanus. In modern times, when we first start talking about, for example, the usage of dogs, then of course the first thing that comes to mind is law enforcement. Police dogs are also known in English with the name K9, a homophone of the word K9. 
The duties of police dogs are to assist law enforcement personnel searching for drugs, explosives, locating people, crime scene evidence and protecting agents. German Shepherds and Belgian Malinois being the most commonly used. Law enforcement has been using dogs since medieval times. For instance, the Paris constables bloodhounds that were used for hunting down outlaws in France, or the bloodhounds used in Scotland. Night watchmen in 19th century London would guard premises being provided with firearms and dogs to protect themselves. Now, unfortunately, when talking about modern times and the usage of dogs, we do have to mention the First and Second World Conflicts, the World War I and World War II. And there are two names, two kinds of, of uh, applications of dogs that, uh, that we should remember. First is the tank dogs, and the second is the mine dogs. Now, let me explain how these worked. Tank dogs were used to damage or destroy enemy tanks, and they were used by both the by, by the Allies mostly. So they were used by uh, American troops and Russian troops. Now the way these dogs were trained is that in the very first years, these dogs would be they would be starved, and then on the verge of starvation, they would be fed or they would be served food under tanks. Now repeating this sort of training, when they would be deployed on the battlefield, the starving dogs, the famished dogs, would be running and then as soon as they would see or identify a tank, they would just run underneath the tank thinking to find food. Now unfortunately these dogs would be striped with explosives and which would be detonated once the animal would be underneath the enemy tank to damage said tank. This form of tactics did not work properly as dogs would be scared by battlefield noise and sometimes would even run underneath allied tanks. Mine dogs uh, they would have to find these artificial mines which would not explode, of course, in training, but they would still buzz the dog, buzz the animal um, pretty severely, creating a severe form of stress which the dogs would uh, experience. And in fact, uh, even tests on uh, lab rats showed that some rats preferred starvation over being buzzed and being electrified, resulting in just isolating themselves in the corner of their cages. All right then, so today's um, guest star, Billy, is my friend Salvo's dog. And this Hello. is Salvo from Better Call Sal channel. If you haven't checked him out, please go check him out. He's got a good channel. What, what do you talk about on your channel, mate? Well, I talk about women. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you wish. <laughs> what do you talk about? Talk about, um, well, I do like perform some instrumental music and I talk about I like to, to travel around, so I make some, you know, traveling in Sicily here. videos, yeah, in Sicily here. And uh, I also talk about weapons every now and then, and I would mm. like to implement that more. And also, he makes pasta, so definitely Metatron's channel approved. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, he makes pasta videos. So if you're interested in a little bit of, you know, Italian culture, Southern Italian culture, check him out. And sometimes he's also got um, videos of the backstage of my videos when we go outside because he's always part of my crew. Yeah, so yeah, you can also check, you know, check those out. Yeah, that's fun, that's fun. It's, it's a lot of fun, uh, yeah. You'll see some things, like you'll see like behind the scenes. Precisely, and they are not, they are unreleased on my channel. So if you want, you can also do that. Okay, better call Cell channel, link in the description below. Thank you. All right then, well, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. Please let me know what you think about the idea of taking a few more days to prepare uh, more detailed and videos for you. I hope that you enjoyed this and that you found the information I have selected interesting. Thank you very much for your support, patience, and thank you for watching. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye. <laughs>